Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. Happy um, Thursday, Christmas Eve 2020. Uh, boy, the year can't come to an end fast enough for me. I don't know about you, but um, I'm hoping we can put this one behind us and move on to 2021, the year. Things are going to turn around. They're going to get better and um, and be more more uh, uplifting and enlightening. Oh, excuse me. Oh, it is Thursday afternoon, and as I do every uh, Thursday afternoon at 4 p.m., I am the podcast lawyer going live to answer legal questions that you might have uh, about podcasting and the law and the business of podcasting and those kinds of things. So um, I think what I'm going to do is uh, just uh, invite you to say hello in the chat if you're watching live or in even if you're watching on the replay, say something so I know you watched. I love to uh, uh, interact with my my audience when I do these things. And it doesn't look like well, a couple people here now, so that's exciting. Very good, very good. Um, I'm actually going to go into the, into the live and just make sure everything's working. Okay, I am, in fact, live now. I had done a false start. I thought I was live and I wasn't, so I just want to make sure... It's all good. So I'm going to just uh, give this one more quick share on my main page and uh, on my home feed, I should say. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're watching live, say hello. Say hello. Someone just made a comment. There's Julian. Nice to see you. Julian, are you the one who was asking the question that led to a big debate today on, um, I think it was the Buzzsprout group? Um uh, I'm going to be talking. You you inspired me to talk about this this issue and these questions. So uh, I hope so. Um, and I hope you don't mind me calling you out. <laughs> so anyway, who else is here? If you're watching live, say hello. And I'm just I'm wearing my my Santa cap. So yeah, it was you. Okay, good. Well, we're going to talk about that in just a moment. I've got to actually go and get my um, uh, my notes for the question up here. So, um, all right, well, let's just jump in. Actually, let me, let me switch over to my other screen real quickly here. I'm just going to get rid of this holiday festivity wreath around there and just come uh, into this one. And uh, this is getting a little warm and itchy, so I'm actually going to take that off. What happened to my hair? Okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, so uh, here's what Julian had to say. So uh, this, this question was posted earlier today, I think, Julian, and uh, you, you said, I've struggled to find out what the law is with playing music on a podcast. I guess falling afoul of licensing and distribution is stopping me from getting started. First of all, I'm going to say, don't hesitate to get started. Just do it and do it without the music if you can. Um, I want to discuss the tracks as part of the context of the show. So is it acceptable to play songs? And if so, how long a segment? Are there any rules to abide by for distribution on Apple, Spotify, Acast, etc.? cetera? Uh, context would be that I like to ask the guest for their favorite rock track, and then we discuss why they like it so much. So Julian, it sounds like a great show. It really does. And unfortunately, it is very difficult to get the permission to use the material that you want. But unfortunately, that is the requirement. Um, there is there is a principle in American copyright law, U.S. only copyright law, a couple other countries have similar principles, called fair use. In other places, it's called fair dealing. But the fair use rule is based on the, the U.S. Um, First Amendment, freedom of speech and freedom of the press. And so it balance, it's an attempt to balance, I should say, the... Uh, interests of copyright protection with the interests of free speech. Not always easy to do. It's a very complicated four-factor, multi-part test, and there's no one determinative factor. You're going to hear all these rules of thumb put, put out there by people, and they're not true. You know, I'm not making any money, so it's okay. Not true. That doesn't matter. Copyright infringement happens when you make the copy. It doesn't matter whether you're making money or not. Um, and making a video or, or, uh, or an audio recording with a, a song embodied in it is making a copy. It's called making a derivative work, actually. Um, what else? I'm only using a few seconds. Well, if it's, the, if it's an important few seconds, that may or may not be um, a meaningful factor. 
Uh, what else? Um, I'm transforming it. There's a lot of talk about transforming. That transformativeness is an important component, but it's not as as easy to do, especially when you're talking about the music and you know whatever. The purpose and character of your use. That's the I'm I'm doing a critique or a commentary. That might be your saving grace in here, but you've got to weigh all four of these factors: purpose of character, purpose and character of the use, the nature of the original, the um, amount and substantiality taken, and the impact on the market for the original. So you can't go for any rules of thumb. There are none. That analysis has to be done. That four-factor balancing weirdness has to be done for each individual use of music. And so I got to say, it's it's more trouble than it's worth to rely on fair use because you really only get to have that conversation after you get sued, after you get the DMCA takedown notice, after you get punished by your hosting provider, whatever, because... Uh, it's a defense to the copyright infringement uh, lawsuit. It is not a free pass uh, to to use material, and there's no no lawyer can tell you just go ahead and do it um, without knowing the specifics of each individual use. So you're gonna have to have a lawyer do this analysis on each episode. I think it's probably cheaper to get the music rights <laughs> to, than to hire a lawyer to do it. So I want to talk a little bit about how you actually go about getting those music rights. Uh, but before I do, I just want to say Keon is here, and, or Kian. Um, you have to bounce off to watch a movie with the kids, but you wanted to say hello. Uh, uh, hello to you, too. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, anyway, uh, let me show you in uh, on the screen of how I would go about identifying the rights holders for a piece of music. And uh, we'll, we'll actually just do a search live and, and, and make it happen. So what I'm going to do is show you my browser and hi, I'm still, okay, I'm still on the screen. So here's my browser, I'm zoomed in a little bit. You can see that we are on ASCAP.com. That's what's in that address bar there, ASCAP, A-S-C-A-P. That's the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. I'm coming at this from an American uh, point of view because I am myself an American. So um, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go to ASCAP.com, and right here over on the, on the left column, I'm gonna actually click on Repertory, and it's gonna, uh, talk to us about this search. And you can type in the title of a song. Let's just use Hound Dog. And it's by Elvis Presley, ladies and gentlemen, or recorded by Elvis Presley. That was the performer. Now, I happen to know who wrote the song, but if you don't, that's fine. You can usually find it by using the performer. Now, this is a brand new tool. They've just announced this in the last few days, apparently. Uh, this uh, repertory search has gotten broader. It uses Song View and not just their, their in-house library. It used to be that you'd have to go to lots of different places to search this stuff out to make sure. Now they seem to be giving us a broader song view combined ASCAP and BMI database. So there's the song, Hound Dog, and you can see they don't actually control any of that song, right? Right here? They don't control it. It's 0% ASCAP and 100% BMI. Now that's not an import, a too important factor for you for podcasting because you're using the music in a recorded embodiment of a show. It's not just a straight ahead broadcast that would be covered by ASCAP and BMI. You're making a derivative work and you're going to stream it and allow it to be downloaded. So here's some more information about what's going on. You've got, uh, the song is written by Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller, Lieber and Stoller Music is now owned by Sony ATV Songs, Inc., or uh, LLC, excuse me. And you can, um, you can track down Sony ATV Songs, LLC by doing a search. Oh, it's interesting. It used to be that these were clickable and you could get their, uh, their contact information. So what we will do is uh, Google uh, Sony ATV Songs Licensing. And, and go from there. So let me get myself a new page. Sony ATV songs licensing and see if they give us a um, sonyatv.com. And this is basically the process. You would need to track down licensing rights. Let's just see here. Um, this may not be... Uh, the best thing, contact us. You can go to the contact page and contact them in, I don't know, their Nashville office, for example. You can always reach out to them at this email address or this phone number to get the right contact information. Now, one little trick I will share is that if you go to bmi.com, because this is a BMI song, and do the same kind of search, 
except we're going to do it here in their in their song view listing. You're going to go. Um, what did I say? Hound dog. And Elvis. Oops, going to tell it here. A performer. Elvis. And let's run it, the search in the BMI repertoire here, and we'll find it. And we have to accept their terms. And right here, we can find the details about Sony ATV songs in their database. And there's an address. Oops. There's the address and contact information. It's the same information we just had. So just you would write to info at sonyatv.com and ask for a license for what you want to do. Now, that's the thing. You are using the music in multiple ways. Even though it seems like it's a simple thing, what you're actually doing when you use a piece of music is you're using both the musical composition, which is controlled in this case by the music publisher, that company that we see there, uh, Sony ATV, and they control the musical composition, but they don't control the sound recording. The sound recording of Elvis's version of Hound Dog belongs to whatever record company it was that pub uh, that released that album or that record back in the day, which I think was Sun Music. So whoever is now the owner of the catalog that belonged to Sun Music, whatever it was, um, and I could be wrong about which which song, which label, that's who you'd have to track down for those rights. So you have now two different companies that you have to deal with to use one recorded piece of music because there's a song that was written by the songwriters, Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller, that is embodied in a recording made by a record company featuring the performance of, of Elvis Presley. Record company owns the rights to Elvis's recording, so you don't have to worry about Elvis's rights, but you do have to get the label permission to use the recording, which is called a master. So we've got the master and we've got the sync, which is the synchronization of the composition with picture and other sound in the, or, or, or other sound in your uh, audio video production of your podcast. So that means that you've got two shops and two sets of rights. There's the, the streaming use and there's the downloadable use, which is a copy, right? So there's a performance and a copy being made. So what you need is, what I, what I would do is if, if you're gonna do this, is contact both of these companies, the, the publisher and the record company, and tell them, I'm doing a podcast, I wanna use, I need a sync license, and I need a master use license that covers both recording, uh, both downloads and streams. And that's it. That's, so it's two-stop shopping for two sets of rights each. So there's four different components going on. That way, you don't have to worry about BM, uh, excuse me, ASCAP and BMI licenses. You don't have to have blanket licenses in place there. Those would only cover a portion of the rights necessary. So that's the process, and that's why it is so challenging to use a single piece of music in a podcast episode. And you have to call them up and negotiate the terms of that license agreement, which will probably mean paying some money. Do you want to be doing that every week for your show every, in every episode? Julian, if I were you, I think what I would do is uh, – I'm going to answer your question in a second or respond to your comment. But what I would do if I was in your shoes is I wouldn't play the song. You can still have a meaningful conversation with a uh, uh, an artist or a celebrity about what's your favorite song – and you know, just warn them. Don't don't sing it. Don't hum it. I mean, you know, a few lines maybe it's okay, but but um, under that fair use principle. But better not to use that music in the show. You can talk about it. You can say, "Hey, I loved um, um, Hound Dog by Elvis Presley. It was it was important in the formation of my musical influences." And uh, just be done with it there. That that you can have a conversation about it without ever playing the song for the audience. You can even say, "Hey, audience." Go find this song. It's available on Spotify. It's available on Apple Music or whatever. But if you put it into your episode, then you're kind of stuck. And if you don't get the rights and the publishers don't like what you're doing, either they decide that it, you've, too, you've used too much or, they, or you shouldn't have used any, whatever, they can take your episode down by notifying the hosting company, your podcast host, Buzzsprout, Podbean, Libsyn, Blueberry, whatever other company you choose, they send a DMCA takedown notice and the company will take it down. They don't want to be in the in the crosshairs of a lawsuit. And so by taking it down, they are guaranteed to be in what's called a safe harbor 
under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA. Now, you have a right to get it put back up if you challenge and say, hey, this is fair use. But again, now you're jumping through extra hoops. Every time you publish an episode, you're going through this process. If your episodes go up on, on YouTube, YouTube's going to take it down automatically because they can see the digital fingerprint of the, of the music. And then again, proving that you have a license or that you have um, fair use is going to be on you, and that is extra hoops you don't want to jump through. So my advice is don't don't use the song. Talk about it all you like. That's perfectly legit. Um, if you have to use a little piece, make it very little. You know, ten seconds, whatever. If you if you play thirty seconds of a two minute song, you've played a fourth of the song, right? That's a substantial taking, and so that's that's the issue. It's only a, a tiny little chunk of your podcast episode, but it's a significant chunk of the song. And so it could be construed as infringement. Now, in the Facebook group that Julian and I were exchanging discussion about, there's a lot of, um, there, there was one person in particular who was saying, just do it. You're not going to get caught. It's not a big deal. They're not going to come after you. You're too small, all those kinds of things. Um, and, and I have to take issue with that. I, you know, as an entertainment and music, well, a podcast lawyer, I hear from clients every single week who have gotten a takedown. And they're not excited about telling the world that they got in trouble, right? They're not going to go talking about it. And so this particular guy, Michael, I think his name is, kept asking, well, who has it happened to? It's, that's not the point. It does happen. It's happened to some of the bigger podcasts, the How It Works folks. It happens to the ones at the big networks. And if a, if a, pod, a publisher or a label doesn't like what you're doing for whatever reason, they will not hesitate to take you down. They will not hesitate to sue you if you get it put back up. I've seen it. It's happened more than a dozen times in the last three or four years that I'm aware of with my clients and, and colleagues' clients, and uh, it is the frequency seems to be increasing. I know that the tempo of DMCA takedown notices at the uh, hosting companies has increased r dramatically in the last year and a half or so, uh, particularly in the last year, I know, and uh, that's not... You just want to be on that, that uh, uh, merry-go-round, so don't do it. Uh, you won't get caught isn't the same as it being legal. And doing the right thing by those songwriters and by the recording artists and the companies that, that uh, have made it possible for them to circulate their stuff is the way we keep allowing stuff to be made, right? We have to be able for artists, I should say, have to be able to uh, make a living from their work or they'll find something else to do. That's the risk. So... Use what pay for what you use, just like you pay for the electricity you use, just like you pay for the food that you consume, just like you pay for the the rent on the apartment or house that you live in or the mortgage to keep a roof roof over your head. The music is one of the raw materials that you're using to to create your show. You need to pay for those raw materials. That's the way I see it. Now, uh, Julian says well, this is fascinating. It sounds like there is no precedent case. Well. I don't know what you mean exactly by precedent case. Uh, I've been practicing entertainment law for almost 30 years, and the process that I described for clearing songs and using music licenses has been something I've done for that whole time, last 28, 29 years, when I work with clients making films or television shows. We'd clear every piece of music that's used. In the live radio arena, you don't have to go through those hoops because it's live radio. And ASCAP and BMI collect for those performances. And they collect in the form of, generally it's blanket licenses that each radio station, each coffee house, each um, restaurant or concert venue, they pay a, a license fee to ASCAP and to BMI. And there's two other outfits like them, CSAC and GMR. And they pay these companies uh, blanket licenses. And the, then those companies using... Uh, log sheets and, and tracking data from the radio stations, they allocate, according to some formula, using algorithms and so on, how much of the gross revenue they collect gets allocated to which songs and which artists and publishers and, and so on, record label. So that's how that's done. There's no, uh, there's no license for a regular terrestrial radio station using a recording because of a wrinkle in the copyright law. Now, when it's on digital, that's different. There is such a thing required. And because podcasts are a digital medium, that's why we have to worry about the recording as well as the composition. So you can see there's a complicated web of, of uh, legal 
rights and restrictions and, and coverage and types of use that we have to navigate. And podcasting being this, it's sort of a hybrid medium, right? We've got streams and downloads. We've got, sometimes we do video, sometimes we don't, right? All of this is stuff we have to consider. So uh, best advice is just, look, if, if, you do, if you don't own it, if you don't have permission from the owner to use the thing, don't use the thing. It's just going to be too much hassle if you, if you try to do it otherwise. Um, if they get wind and decide to come after you. And it, it only takes one, right? The loss that you could suffer as, a, um, as an infringer is pretty significant. You know, the, the law provides for statutory damages. That means that uh, you don't have to prove, the, the, the owner of a copyright doesn't have to prove how much they've lost in order to sue you. All they have to prove is that you copied their work. And, you know, they make the case for how egregious it is. And then the judge or the jury has the prerogative to decide anywhere from between $750 to $150,000 in damages, depending on how serious the violation is perceived. That's per act of infringement. If you use a different song in every episode, um, you've got an act of infringement for every episode. If you use the same song in every episode, you've got a separate act of infringement for each episode. If you use multiple songs, you're multiplying that, right? So it's pretty, it's pretty risky, I would say, to, uh, to go down this path. So that's the process. You got to find out who owns it, contact them, ask for the license, probably wait weeks for them to respond and say, yes, go ahead. They can say no. And, um, that's one of the rights of the copyright holder is the right to say no to a use they don't approve of or they just choose not to authorize if they don't feel there's enough money there. And that's another issue in this is how do you how, how should they charge for a podcast? Let's say you've got a small podcast with a few thousand listens um, and you ask a, a music publishing company or a record company to give you a license to use a particular song for your, what, 2,000, 3,000 listeners – how much can they legitimately charge you? And is it worth it for them to dedicate staff time and resources to preparing a license, to answering your query and preparing a license and so on? Figure it takes one of their paralegals or lawyers uh, an hour to deal with it. How much are those people making per hour? A few hundred dollars. Are you willing to pay a few hundred dollars per song just to break even for them? Maybe not, especially for your, your very low listenership thing. So the economics right now don't favor doing this kind of thing. Wayne is here. Hello, Wayne. And Julian is here. Um, and Wayne is saying hello to Julian. Nice to see you. Julian says, wow, minimum $750 per infringement. Uh, would there be such a thing as a blanket podcast license one day? Well, the problem is you've got so many different rights holders. And, and ASCAP and BMI were set up you know, in the, in the 1930s and 40s, I think, maybe even earlier than that. Um, and uh, they were the result of some consent decrees and, and lawsuits and things like that. So kind of a big deal to, uh, uh, to get something organized like that. I know that there is a move afoot to try to do this. And um, if the labels are willing to play ball, which is, is a big maybe, um, we might get some version of it. I'll tell you that there's a, an outfit out there called uh, podcastmusic.com that is trying very hard to get that to work. Um, but they are having, a, you know, the expected challenges getting the record labels that own the masters to come on board because, again, it just isn't enough money there to share. And when you, now you have to share it with other intermediaries in order to collect those blanket royalties. Pretty hard to do. So the, there are some artists that are releasing their stuff to uh, podcastmusic.com, and it's an exciting prospect, but you're not going to get the big famous songs that your guests are probably going to mention right off the bat. So, um, um, so it's a great idea and I hope it will come to pass. I think we're a couple of years away from it being, um, robust enough to be useful to podcasters right now. Uh, certainly worth having a look at what podcastmusic.com is doing and, um, uh, it might be the right thing for you. But in the meantime, I think, you know, staying away from the music is probably, it's certainly the path of least resistance, uh, unless you're really, you know, insisting on doing a music intensive show, in which case maybe do it on Anchor as a Spotify exclusive podcast with music, which is a, a new 
kind of podcast that they're creating where the music is pulled from the Spotify catalog. And since it's all Spotify listeners, they're already covered. They're already paying those royalties um, because Spotify has a, you know, it's only a stream, not a download, those kinds of things. Wayne says, hi, Gordon, would love to have you come on and speak at our PodFest Asia virtual event from January 28th and 29th. And uh, that would be great. I'd love to, uh, Julian. I'm sorry, not Julian, Wayne. Best thing to do is reach out to me uh, uh, just on uh, a DM. Send me a, di a digital, uh, digital direct message here on Facebook and I'll get you the information on how to book me and that kind of stuff. No problem, I'd love to do it, sounds like fun. Um, Wayne says, Julian, you were killing it. Oh, Julian was a guest on Wayne's podcast. Wayne, what's the title of your podcast? I'd love to know that. Um, Wayne says, Julian was killing it on the podcast, learned so much about AI and 5G trends and marketing. Oh, that's awesome, nice. Uh, Julian, thanks, podcast music sounds interesting, but even then making it global would still be an issue. Yes. That's another component is that all of these rights are controlled by different companies in different parts of the world. And so going global, no, you know, the way ASCAP and BMI do it is they have reciprocal relationships with, um, with collection societies in other countries. And so it all sort of gets channeled through the, the home country uh, entity of the artist <clears throat> in question, the publisher or the record label, whatever. And so it is doable. They've got that sort of figured out. But we're just not there yet with podcasts, and I think we're a few years away still. Um, the CMO Asia podcast. Oh, that's interesting. Cool, Wayne. Uh, yeah, I'd like to know more about this um, uh, PodFest Asia um, virtual event in January. That sounds like fun. Uh, I'll have to check it out. I'll, I'll Google it later on. Um, what else was I going to talk about today? So so that was my first topic. Um Another one, uh, this was one that actually came up a while ago, and I think I talked about it a little bit, but I want to reiterate. A question in one of the groups was uh, posed for co-hosts and business owners that podcast full-time. question was, I'm curious when you guys started making money, how did you treat the business and start dividing the money amongst yourselves? Uh, my answer is don't wait until it starts coming in. Figure this out at the very beginning. The sooner the better. This is what I talk about in my uh, Facebook group, Legit Podcast Pro. And um, you can get more information about that, legitpodcastpro.com, or just sign up for the group, Legit Podcast Pro. Uh, because I think that unless you've got these things sort of taken care of at the early days, you are sort of podcasting naked without a net. You know, things bad things can happen, um, and they do happen. I just heard today about a, a, a co-host who departed the show, and the remaining host is sort of you know, trying to figure out what's next. What do I do? And do I start a new show? Can I use the old show? Can I keep the feed? You know, all these kinds of things. You need to figure this stuff out at the beginning when everybody's friendly, work it out in a nice, you know, friendly way so that you don't have problems later on when somebody's angry or upset or just, you know, exhausted with things. And, um, and then that's when you get into disputes and, and trouble. So definitely want to, um, want to get those kinds of things squared away and, and dealt with ahead of time. Uh, sorry, I've got stuff happening on my screen that I want to get rid of here. Okay. So um, let's see. What else we got here? Yeah, so don't wait to do those kinds of things. Should you incorporate or form an LLC? It may be too soon to do that right away at the beginning, although I wouldn't always say so. If you're planning on making it a business, Start it out like a business. Invest in the business because that will make you think of it as a business. Uh, protecting your intellectual property, registering your copyrights, registering your trademarks, and that's a great, uh, a great next one. Um, uh, next topic that I'll talk about here. Somebody just said something. I wanted to say hello, uh, Julian. Uh, thank you for the music. Really pleased that I shared the question. Spend all your researching and thinking about it and results of this conversation today. Julian, are you here in the U.S. or or I got the sense you might be in the U.K. Um, the process is fundamentally the same in the U.K., although maybe a little easier to navigate. Um, you could certainly well answer my question. Are you in the? If you're in the U.K., I can tell you where you want to go. You want to contact PRS which is the UK version of ASCAP and BMI. Um, if you're in another country, every country has its own. These are called performance rights organizations, PROs, and you want to contact yours locally because some in some countries they do license these kinds of uses. So uh, I don't know whether PRS does it. I think they might. And if so, then 
you might be okay, but you got to check in with them and ask the right questions. Um, if they can grant you a podcast license that covers all of the things I talked about, both composition and recording and live streams and downloads, then you're golden. Um, my understanding is they probably can't, but I, I've heard mixed reviews on that on that thing. Okay, uh, so uh, next question that came into my group here, let me see into my notes. Um, oh, the similar question. I've interviewed a musician for our next episode and he sang a couple of songs, one of which is a cover of another musician's song. He sang it a cappella. Do you know if that's copyright infringement? Yes, it is. If you don't have permission, it is infringement. Should we, do we need to pay royalties for an acapella cover version of an established song, which albeit is from 1978? Short answer is yes, you do. Um, ultimately, this particular person decided not to bother using the track. The other song he sang was one of his own, so we can use that one. Not necessarily, not so fast. If he's not signed with the record, with the music publishing company, then maybe you can still use that song if he gave permission. Um, uh, but... Um, Artists that are of a big enough, you know, big enough to be on record labels and have music publishing deals may not even control the rights to the songs that they've written or performed because uh, they've made these deals with these publishing companies that are responsible for collecting that stuff. Um, so what else? What else? All right. So let me answer the, let me talk about trademarks a little bit and then I've got to wrap it up. Um, let me turn off those notifications here. That's being annoying. Okay, so what's a trademark? Well, trademark is a distinctive word or symbol or phrase or uh, logo design indicator of the source or origin of goods or services. So when you put a symbol on your product, your, your, right? Coke is a trademark of the Coca-Cola company identifying this beverage as coming from that company. You know. Right when you buy a particular um, kind of coffee, you know Nescafe is a trademark of the Nestle company. Um, here in the states, we have Oreo cookies, right? Product of Nabisco, the National Biscuit Company. The red triangle on the corner of the package of Oreos or Triscuit crackers or or uh, saltines or whatever else. All of these are um, trademarks, symbols that indicate the origin of the goods or services. Those are what can be trademarked if they are distinctive and identify that goods or service. Why is it important to think about this for podcasts is your title of your show can be a trademark. It becomes distinct, a distinctive identifier of your show's source original. This is that particular show about this particular topic from this particular podcaster or company or host or whatever. And the reason that's important is that it would be very confusing if somebody else came into the space and created a show about the same topic with the same or similar title in a way that's likely to be confused, right? Suddenly you go looking for that show about whatever topic and you find theirs instead of yours. That's a problem. Your listenership goes down, theirs goes up, they're capitalizing on your success or they're tarnishing your reputation by putting out a crappy show under the same title. All of these things can be bad for your podcasting business. Now, whether you think of it as a business or not, I think this is something you want to really think hard about. Protect your title. So you register it. Here in the U.S., we have a registration system that involves filing a, a, um, an application. We do it online. It's a fairly complicated application, but it can be a DIY, do-it-yourself kind of a thing. Um, you, uh, you access that registration system here in the U.S., it's the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and you click on trademarks, and you go to the application online and all that, and you fill out the process, uh, fill out the, the, the application online. How long does it take? Well, you know, the, filling out the application might take you, I did a couple today, it took me about 25 minutes for each one. I know what I'm doing, it probably would take you an hour to an hour and a half to do uh, to go through that process. You pay a fee, a, a fee of a few hundred dollars, depend it's going up next week, but it's in the neighborhood of 300, 350 dollars. And uh, the process then starts the ball rolling. Your application gets handled by oh and you oh and you submit evidence of the use of the mark because trademarks are uh, acquired by use. Uh, that begins the, the the cycle which takes about six months for them to 
intake it and look at it and examine the application and let you know if there are any problems. If not, then they will let you know that it's been approved and they're going to publish it in the in the uh, official gazette of the trademark um, um, of the trademark office. That opens up a window of time for people to object to it if they find that it's confusingly similar to their own marks. And assuming no objections, then the registration issues usually eight to ten to twelve months after the original application gets filed. The cost, as I said, a few hundred dollars if you do it yourself, if you bring in a lawyer, of course, several hundred dollars more than that for using a lawyer. And, um, and, uh, and that's the process. I think it is worthwhile if you are thinking of your podcast as a business and you have a distinctive title and you want to protect yourself against these kinds of things. Now, if your show title does get infringed, whether you have registered or not, if you were first to use the trademark, the brand, you have some recourse. It's much easier if you have a registered trademark. That's why I recommend registering. But it isn't, it isn't a given that you can't win just because you haven't registered. First in time is first in right in trademark law in the United States. Other countries a little different. Uh, you know, Consult someone locally about that. Infringement is when somebody uses a confusingly similar brand or mark or logo or title on goods that compete in the same marketplace. Trademarks are registered in classes of goods and services. So if you have a podcast titled, you know, I don't know, The, uh, the Giant Ball of String Show, um, and somebody wants to create a, I don't know, a, a, an exercise product called The Giant Ball of String, you're probably not going to be able to prevent that. But you could stop somebody from creating a radio show or a television show or a film or a series or you know even books and other other entertainment and media kinds of related things. So that's what infringement would look like. And it's okay to talk about products and services. I'm able to show you a bottle of Coca-Cola, Diet Coke here, and say, hey, this is a product I enjoy. And that's fine. I can talk about Coca-Cola all day long. Again, as long as I'm not disparaging the product and, and making false statements about it, uh, I'm on on uh, safe ground uh, for trademark purposes because I'm not I'm not holding out my thing as belong as being Coca Cola and I'm not holding myself out as being related to the product. I'm just saying I use the product and that's that. So that's trademark. And I just looked at the clock and I realized I've been going for quite a while. Um, let's see. Um, Julian, is there a register for Sonic Audio trademarks? Those chief marketing officers are really interested in this, aren't they? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah, for uh, audio trademarks. Um, yes, uh, example. Um, you're all familiar with the MGM film company, Mo the Metro Goldwyn Mayer. The Sound of the Lion's Roar has been registered as a trademark. The Sound of the Throaty Rumble of the Harley Davidson motorcycle engine and muffler. I believe that has also been registered as a trademark. There are, are a few of them. They're fairly few and far between. I think the Nokia uh, uh, ringtone back in the day, God, 20 years ago now, um, was also a registered trademark. So it is possible to register sequences of tones or particular sounds as unique identifiers. And yes, absolutely. In fact, um, the, uh, the, and the NBC television network here in the United States for years and years and years used a three note chime melody. Uh, the notes were G E C bum, bum, bum. And I believe they still do. Um, G E C NBC for a while was owned by the general electric corporation. So G E C G E C. And that became a, a trademark signal that this is an NBC show. You didn't have to be looking at the screen to know this was coming from the National Broadcasting Company. So it is possible to do sonic audio trademarks. I think I answered your question, Julian. All right. Uh, it's quarter to five Pacific time here now. That means it oh, must be very late in the UK. Wow. Julian, you're, is it is it really uh, a midnight or, or almost 1 a.m. there in, in England? <laughs> okay. Uh, more power to you, and I don't know what time it would be in the in Asia, uh, where you are, Wayne. But uh, it's all good. It's all good. Well, listen, I'm going to say thanks for being here. I'm going to go um, spend Christmas Eve with my family, and I wish you all a very, very merry Christmas, happy, happy holiday, and um, I'll see you again next week with more of this. 
presentation when the podcast lawyer speaks. See you soon.